Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be here today with Kevin Bruner. Kevin Bruner is a musician. He uh, he has worked with his group Small Town Poets for a long time. He's worked with CD Baby for a long time and also is a co-anchor of one of my favorite podcasts, which is the <laughs> DIY Musician Podcast. So I'm excited to have the conversation with him about all, whatever, it you know, kind of wherever it goes. But I really want to talk about kind of the 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 creator economy and how um how social media of late has really changed how we release music and stuff like that we'll get into that in a minute i just would love for you kevin to give them a little bit of background in case people haven't heard of you um and just kind of your music journey and maybe a little bit about your work with cd baby yeah well thanks for having me on the podcast yeah i i you you covered the three main <laughs> pieces <laughs> that yeah i've uh you know i I'm an artist, a musician, and that's what, you know, started my whole journey, went to Nashville to pursue a music career, and that's where I ended up in the band Small Town Poets, and we were signed and to a major label and had a, had a bunch of success there, but it was one, it was the mid to late 90s, and it was, you know, one of those things where everyone's getting paid ex except us. We're the last to benefit from all this work we're doing, and, and the, just a whole bunch of other things that... Uh, that I think are just, we're backwards about how that system worked. Um, things have changed some, but it's still, you know, so I left that thinking there's gotta be a better way and ended up in the Northwest and started writing and recording independent music. And that's when I found CD Baby and got a job there and was just passionate about helping artists understand how they could own their career how they could build direct relationships with fans, how they could, because a lot of the perceptions of artists, especially at this, that particular time was that, hey, I'm just gonna sign with a label and all my problems will be solved. I'm like, no, this is your business, this is your career and this is your music and you need to understand what all that means. Um, and that's why I started the DIY Musician Podcast because I'd be having conversations with artists all day long. I'm like, I wish I could record these and <laughs> make it available for other people to hear. Uh, and then on, on the other hand, I would be on a call with an artist who's like, I'm on this platform called YouTube and I just started making videos. And I don't even have to tour anymore. I'm like, tell me everything about that because I want to know all the details, every little detail. Um, and so, yeah. So over the years, it's just been an interesting ride as, as the business has changed and evolved. And, you know, when I when I first started working at CD Baby, the band Small Town Poets that I'm in was on a bit of a hiatus, but we started making records independently again and have made 10 albums now and um, have had other projects and actually currently starting to manage a few artists and working on a record. Actually, if you could see the floor below me, you'd see guitar pedals everywhere because I'm working <laughs> on guitar tracks for this album, for this artist that uh, I'm collaborating with and, and managing and um so yeah i'm i'm all that to say is i'm in the trenches with everybody else i've been seeing it from both sides both the industry side and the artist side and i've just been trying to you know uh help artists understand how they can build an audience and build a career and and you know own all that relationship and their music and everything else yeah, I think that's what's so great about the DIY musician podcast is that like you guys are in the trenches you're you're seeing both sides at once you know, I know Chris, Chris Robley, you know, he's mm -hmm. a, he's an active artist. And, you know, so I think it's, it's like, you can see like the overarching trends, but then you can also be like, yeah, I, I tried this the other day and here's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, that that's part of what I think 
got me fired up to do this stuff in the first place. And as and as CD Baby started growing and and our both mine and Chris's roles growing there, um, and us uh, seeing the landscape, it, it was like there's a lot of people that will just tell artists, just go do this. It's so easy. I'm like, they don't understand what it's like to be an artist. It's not like just getting through the creation process can be agonizing. And then you want me to spend, uh, uh, you know, like a full-time job as a marketer, marketing my music and booking my music and doing all this stuff. It's like, it's so having that, uh, that understanding of what it's like, I think has helped us uh, communicate with artists just to know that, Hey, I know it's tough. I know that it, things can be can sound super simple, but it takes a lot of time and effort and emotional investment. And that's on top of making all the music. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Now, what what year did you guys start the, the DIY Musician podcast? Do you remember? 2007. Oh, my gosh. OK, that was really early. Yeah. And I know it wasn't like weekly or anything back then, but like it, it must be interesting to go back and look at some of those episodes and look at the trends. And, you know, I think about now and like how important TikTok is to a lot of musicians and releasing. And and it's like, OK, well, what am I going to think of this in 10 years? You know, if I go back and look at these episodes that are about like, oh, my gosh, people are blowing up on, you know, some yeah. social media you've never heard of anymore, like Periscope or something. You yeah. know, it, it must be interesting to see those trends. Yeah, I remember Vine was one that I had artists reaching out to me. I'm making tons of money on Vine. I'm like, nobody oh, knows what Vine. Vine. Twitter bought it and put it out of business immediately. Yeah, it, you know, what's what's fascinating is our number two episode. Uh, so we did, we were, this was a true like napkin story. We went to, it was Chris, myself, and there was a different Chris. So at the beginning, there was three of us. We went to this pizza place on our lunch break at CD Baby. And we were gonna plan out the first 10 episodes because the big thing back then was, the term was pod fading. People were like, I'm starting a oh, podcast. Yeah. And they do one episode, two episodes, and you never hear from them again. And it might be a good idea too. You're like, man, I wish they'd make more episodes, but it's challenging. So I'm like, we are not doing that. So we're gonna go plan out the first 10 episodes. And we got to this pizza place and nobody brought anything to write anything down. <laughs> so we ended up, we literally wrote it all on a napkin, but like, okay, there's 10, solid episodes if we can make it this far i feel good uh, and but the number two episode that we did is still one of the most relevant things and we talk about it all the time it's the authentic artist branding mm. um the the person i interviewed was uh a, a big um she she booked for a lot of the the one of the big um club chains club restaurant bar pub chains here in portland and she also did a lot of help helping managing other artists um but and she's since passed which was very sad but um but that advice is like still incredibly relevant and it'll never go it, it'll it's always about it's about developing your artist persona and brand and how once you define that how much all these other things uh flow from it and it makes it easier whether it's merch your marketing campaigns just communication with your fans and that's so relevant because artists still i think that's one of their biggest struggles is they they don't know how to market or communicate or um what's going to work because they haven't figured out that sort of their artist identity as like a brand persona and so yeah that episode is uh we we've we've done variations of it multiple times since and it's always a, a favorite so yeah so looking back there's some stuff like that that's still evergreen. There's some stuff that we're talking about MySpace and it's like, that is <laughs> that is uh, not relevant anymore. <laughs> yep, yep. And so it's always like, as a musician, it's like, do I go all in on this thing? Like, I don't know if it's gonna, you know, be here in a year. It's so hard to know. Yeah, yeah. And, and thinking about, like I, I mentioned Vine, that I don't know why that popped into my head, but that was one of those where when that trend was happening, I was like, this isn't, this isn't going to stick. Mm. I don't, I, I'm like six second videos. I, I don't, I don't think this is going to last. Um, and that trend um, died quickly. Yeah. That it made no sense to me. Like as a musician, how can you even like experience a piece of any kind of art in six seconds? Yeah. But you know, there's artists that became popular out of that. As yep. far as I know, Sean Mendez came out of that. Oh really? I didn't. I didn't. I. That's what my kids told me. I was oh, like, how did he get popular? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, could be. <laughs> yeah, I know. I knew that there was there were like I had talked to an artist that was like making serious money off of it, off of like like brand partnerships that people do on TikTok and stuff right now. And I just thought, man, this is why six seconds? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> it's so challenging on the creator side. And as a consumer, it's like you barely get a taste of anything. Yeah. And, and I thought the same thing about 15 second TikToks, because there was definitely that trend of, you know, keep your TikToks to 15 seconds. Yeah. And even in the beginning is like, that was like the main thing that people were doing. I'm glad that that's not popular now. Yeah. And I do think that TikTok has now been around long enough. And like, there's been enough proof out of it that artists have become super successful or their releases have blown up because of TikTok. I think it's it's not going to be that flash in the pan like Vine or stuff like that. But I would love to know, you know, your opinion and just what you've seen working with artists at CD Baby of kind of working a release before it ever is released. Like really all that teasing and stuff like is yeah. how much do you do? Is there too much? Is there like a point where I remember I think I heard on one of you guys' podcast talking about like if you're talking about a release for a year, like people are so over it by the time it gets out. <laughs> Well, you're in luck, Bree, because the very next episode of the DIY oh. Musician podcast that I'm going to upload today is called, uh, I forget the exact title I don't have in front of me, but it's all about building anticipation for your mm -hmm. release. And our premise is when we did our releasing music in 2023 episode, we I really liked that episode because I felt like we covered some, had some new takes on on the idea of releasing music. And then that kind of got me thinking. And then I put the get together the outline for this new episode that we're going to upload. And it's probably my favorite episode we've recorded in a long, long, long time. Mm. Uh, mainly because we talk about just that. And, and what, like, Chris was on a panel with uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, with the, the social media manager for the Backstreet Boys and mm. um, Britney Spears. And she stated something that I'd already been talking about, but stated in a way that I was like, yeah, that's 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 what I mean. Exactly that, that that they don't look at the release day as the day that it comes out on Spotify. They look at it the day they first post something on TikTok and oh. that they sort of look at the Spotify release as almost like a remix. And uh, the way I was talking about it uh, was saying that distribution is no longer the starting point for artists. Um, so, you know, for many, 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 many years, not only just in the digital world, but even before that, a lot of the starting point for artists, especially independent artists, was when the release release day happened. That's mm -hmm. when it begins. But really, our premise for this new episode was if you're releasing music and nobody's going to listen or care, then what's even the point of releasing it? <laughs> Which sounds very dark and kind of like, just give up but that's not what we mean at all what what we're trying to point out is that that what's working a lot and with like tiktok platforms like tiktok and such is that artists are using it to create anticipation so when the release comes out they're familiar with the song they go get it they go listen to it they share it they add it to playlists they're excited for it uh, you know, if you're a famous artist, you have some of that built in. But I still think that that is a trend, a, a thing that's changed and shifted just with music consumption in general. There's so much music. Um, you know, release day used to be a huge day. I used to remember like, who came out? What new mm -hmm. albums came out today? Music comes out. I mean, Friday is supposed to be, you know, International Music Release Day. But people drop music every day and you're like, there's always new music. So it never, there's not this rhythm of anticipation like we used to have. And then you get artists, you know, like I'm a big fan of Death Cab for Cutie. I, I, I think I, I mentioned, I think in that episode where I was like, they mentioned they, it was like April or May of, of last year. They're like, we have a new, new album coming out in September. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, tell me in September, you know, that's just like way too far in the future. I can't even you know, I'm not thinking about September right now, you know, and they, so it was just, they dropped announcement and basically disappeared until then. I'm like, that was kind of not the best approach. And I think a lot of those older major label artists still have that mindset. I, you know, I, I 
I always, I'm a big YouTube fan and I always dump on them all the time for how <laughs> they'll just disappear for years and then make some big announcement about something that's going to happen a year from now as if we care, you know? I'm like, we have too much in our faces all the time to have any sort of mental space for a year from now about an album release for a No, band there's album. too much ability for instant gratification now. Yeah. That we're just going to be like, yeah. Talk so to anyway, with, with these face. tools, uh, like I interviewed an artist uh, named Brittany Kellogg. Uh, she's from the Portland area here. And I had started following her because I knew her manager at the time. And she only had 2,000 TikTok followers. Um, but she started doing this strategy um, of like what a lot of artists are doing. She's like, are you this type of person? And she would have, you know, very description. Then I wrote a song for you and she'd start playing it. This one particular song just exploded. Mm -hmm. And then she kept doing variations of it. She hadn't recorded it yet. And then she would be singing, like sitting in her car, singing along to the demo, uh, just playing acoustic guitar. And it kept getting bigger and bigger. Then it went through the process of recording it and releasing it and all that. And by that time, she had millions and millions and millions of video views around that song. And her TikTok following just was exploding over the course of that. And to me, it was like, OK, now when she releases it, there's people that want to go hear this song. And that kind of being the idea of like what artists have tools to build that anticipation. So when the actual release happens, there's momentum and it kind of propels the song or the release to a new level. Another band that I saw do that recently uh, called Walk Off the Earth. Oh, I love um, them. They do the most um, amazing, I'm trying to get them on the podcast. They do the most amazing videos. I just want to know how long and how much time they spend making these videos because they look so effortless. And I'm like, you know, there was one where they had a bunch of fruit with like the electronic diodes all in the fruit. So when you touched, it would make the drum sounds and the synth sounds. And they they did, they sang their song, uh, but they 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 just released a new single. And they, I counted uh, nine different types of videos that they did promoting that song. One of them that went crazy viral, like 60 million views or 55 million views. And that was all leading up to the release. And so... That's to me what what artists should be thinking about, like how it's not about just go pre-save. It's not about go, um, you know, get on, uh, be prepared to be notified when it drops. It's like, how can you tease them with the song? The, the thing that was interesting about the walk off the earth thing, all those videos, the only thing they had in it was the chorus. And it was kind of this weird realization when they did a, a verse challenge video at one point that of all the videos that they had done, no one had ever heard the verse and no one did hear the verse until it came out. And so I mm -hmm. thought this was, it was pretty genius, the whole thing. And uh, yeah, so that that's the idea of like, you're engaging your fans, getting them excited and they feel like there's a payoff when the release happens too. That's what I liked about the walk off the earth thing because um, when I realized I hadn't heard any of the verses yet. Then, of course, I wanted to go hear the full song. Yeah, I think that you have to have that payoff. I was, just, I was thinking about like the Charlie Puth like light switch thing. And I felt like when the song finally came out, I'm like, I think I've heard this whole song. You know, and so I went yeah. over there on on Spotify and I just added to my playlist because I'm like, well, I don't want to forget about this song. I like yeah. it overall, but I feel like I've heard it all and it's not like a, a revelation or anything. Yeah. So and yeah, how, how to come up with that? Like what is going to be the the payoff for them that they're getting new versus what they've already seen a million times on TikTok. Yeah. And, and what I liked about, you know, what I've, I've been telling artists for a long time, especially as it relates to like running Facebook ads and, you know, creating video ads. It's like, start with the hook of the song. Nobody needs the boring intro. It, it may sound amazing in a listening experience, but social media is not a listening experience uh, mm -hmm. by nature. People are you know, flipping through stuff. And if you can't hook them right away, they're probably going to move on. Um, but yeah, just starting with the hook and creating a bunch of different videos or experiences around just the hook of the song. So it gets in people's head, especially if it's a good song. The thing with Walk Off the Earth, the song is really good and mm. it's very catchy. Um, and, you know, they have some advantages. They're they're very dynamic people. Uh, they They just have 
they're a joy to watch. They're just like this energy just comes off of them when they're in their videos. So, you know, they're good on camera. Um, so that's helpful. Are, are they indie or do they have a label? They are, uh, I believe, indie. We've we've done some of their releases. They've kind of bounced from label back to indie to label back to indie. I think they're indie again. That's what I, I mean. I th I remembered them. I, at least I thought having a label at one point. They did. They, they, they feel very indie, obviously. They were actually with us when they did that five people, one guitar video that was mm. kind of the one that exploded them to to popularity and then they left us to go to a label but then they came back later then they left mm -hmm. again then they came back so you know that which is good for them i mean that's what you want to do you want to use these experiences to get leverage to get people to come in and that can help uh you know push things to the next level yeah and do you think that having a label nowadays still gives you some leverage i was always curious about the, your small town poets experience that you know, there's all the annoying things about being on a label and feeling like you're not getting paid and all that. But do you think when you later entered the market, you were able to kind of springboard off of the publicity that you got from being on a label before instead of starting at zero? Oh, yeah. I mean, we we sold about 300,000 copies. We were nominated for Grammy. We, you know, we uh, we had lots of songs on the radio. Um, so we we had quite a bit of popularity that we wouldn't have had without the label. So, so yeah. And and I think coming out of that experience initially, I mean, with most artists, they'd probably think Kevin is very anti-label. <laughs> That's not necessarily the case. What I want is artists to understand that it's their career and everything is a trade-off. So if you're going to sign with a label, I just want you to understand the trade-offs and understand that there's going to be downsides to it, especially if they own your master recordings. And that doesn't seem like a big deal in the moment. You're like, ah, but then 10 years down the road, when like we have one of our releases that's owned by uh, Capitol Records, they don't have any desire to do anything with it. It's just sitting there collecting dust. And in fact, one, two of the track titles are wrong. They're swapped on, on, uh, Spotify that's something that if if I had control of it at CD Baby I could fix in two minutes right and it's been that way for years um and so it's one of those things where you just have to understand the trade-offs and understand what they're they're bringing to the table um if it's just all they are is just providing distribution you can get that on your own I've talked to a lot of artists that have signed label deals I'm like what it sounds like is you just are getting access to Spotify and they're taking 30%. <laughs> That's not a good deal. But if they're, you know, if you go into it thinking, all right, this is going to be temporary because everybody, except for a very select few elite, everybody's going to get dropped from their label at some point that, um, that you better understand that uh, how is this building your business? How is this building your career? How are you going to, uh, what is it going to look like? when they are no longer in the picture, how are you setting yourself up for that future reality so you're better off um, and you're using what they can provide to grow your audience and, and grow your reach. And, you know, especially, you know, they, they can be ha very useful for things like tour support and stuff like that. So just knowing what you're getting out of it and that there's trade-offs. And the thing is now that a lot of the label deals are far better um, for artists than they used to be. They're still not the best. You still need to know what you're getting yourself into, but the terms are, are much, much better than these days than, than uh, it used to be. And also, actually, I was just talking to someone from Universal who runs their marketing, and she said a lot of their deals now are just a one-song deal. Mm -hmm. That's weird. And so that that really is a totally different. That means they're not invested in you as an artist at all. Mm -hmm. They're just interested in that one asset that's performing what might be performing well on TikTok. They just want to sign that one song, capitalize off the wave that it has, and then move on. They're not interested in developing you as an artist. They're not interested in any sort of long term career trajectory. You could earn maybe work into that type of spot, but still most there's most artists have de have the tools to develop themselves so much on their own that the labels just aren't interested in doing that work anymore. I have a hard time seeing how a one song deal would help an artist because it's like if you 
pushed yourself up there enough to get that kind of attention to be offered that, then why do you need them? If there's yeah, I mean, nothing beyond the one song, you know, I, you know, I would be interested to know what, what they're in those situations, what they do. I mean, they probably put them in some of their big playlists and, you know, for universal, it, it adds, it's another track that's out there that they're getting a slice of the pie from mm. the artist. It could be a little bit more exposure for your song. It just depends. I was actually very intrigued by it. I'm like, I want to know what that deal looks like. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd be thinking. Well, so what do you think about indie labels? Cause I feel like, you know, people, I don't know, everybody's popping up with an indie label nowadays. And it really, to me, a lot of times it doesn't mean a lot for the artist other than maybe access to like a collective of, of like services to help you when you're putting your music out there, but it's really not, they don't really give big advances or anything like that. So I'm just, I've always been just trying to figure out like, how does an indie level help, help an artist at all? Or is it just kind of, you, you could do that on your own? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it's probably a case by case basis. I know a lot of the, 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 on the indie side things that, and some of the, the brands that we have uh, in some sister companies that we have here, are more focused on like the label services type stuff. So like one of our brands, downtown music services, they, they will do an advance. They tend to work with bigger catalog, like uh, high performing catalogs and high performing individual independent artists. So those advances can be pretty sizable and, and you, the artist keeps all their rights and it's usually like a one year term where we get X percent for that year uh, in distribution, but then we that you know that brand will work the release. Mm -hmm. Like they'll they'll create a release plan. They'll they'll do all the stuff to set up to pitch it. You know with the DSPs and and look for all those opportunities. They'll make sure the release goes you know out without any problems, and then they'll kind of help maintain any follow up and stuff like that. Um, and then you know, once the term's up, you can make your choice to leave or not. So there's a lot of them that are starting to do things like that. But yeah, if, if they're not providing any value other than being able to say in your bio that you're signed to a label, I don't know what. Yeah, I think, you know, back in the my day when I was pursuing my own music career and I was super naive, like I thought that like having a label behind you or being on a label would somehow give me more credibility. I don't think that's really true anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I, you're, you're correct. And I, I, I think that's, that's, uh, that has shifted a lot since like, from where it used to be that, yeah, uh, there was sort of like this filter, oh, good artists are on a label. I think for one thing, one thing that uh, I think artists struggle with, and why oftentimes they sign these deals that really don't offer them much value is that we, you know, most artists, myself included, have had people in their life saying, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. When are you going to get a real job? This is cute. Um, when are you going to stop messing around? And uh, and that label, being able to say that, provides mm. some validation to those people to like, see, this is real. Like, look, someone hired me. I have a real job, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is like, this is the real deal. I'm signed to a label. This isn't just me messing around. So I know that that is a big driving force for artists because, you know, most people don't understand creative pursuits and those li that type of lifestyle and that type of, you know, that type of business. And it all works differently. Most people understand I go to a building five days a week sit at a desk and push papers and I'm miserable and complain about it, but it makes sense. <laughs> I get paid. <laughs> so people understand that. It's like they don't understand the creative arts and how those businesses work, especially on, for the artist. And and so I think oftentimes the label is just some sort of like, see, this is real to, to the, so at Thanksgiving, it's not that awkward conversation again. <laughs> That makes sense. Oh, yeah. I did a whole series once about, you know, what, what you say to your like annoying cousin or your annoying aunt or whatever on Thanksgiving. That's like, what's going on with your music? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I actually posted a video about that. Uh, 
I think it was right before Christmas on my own Instagram and TikTok, like uh, making fun of that, you know. And then I asked uh, I had some other people. There was like all these different personas, you know. Uh, it was all I was thinking about this time when I was in college. I my both sides of my grandparents lived not far from where I went to school. And so I would go up to visit them at, at like Thanksgiving and it's me with, you know, a bunch of senior citizens and nobody else. <laughs> and them all just like, I hear the whole industry is going to Branson, Missouri. You need to go to Branson, Missouri. I'm like, oh my gosh. Or then my uncle being like, you need to get a, you're never going to make any money. And it's just like this barrage of all these different, like, oh my gosh, this is the worst. Let me tell you how the world works, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Then somebody chimed in in the comments talking about, oh, but then there's the family member or the family friend that's a lawyer, but they have no concept of, of entertainment law. Oh. And so, but, they, but they've got the ego of a lawyer. So they're just going to tell you that what's what, even though they have no concept of how the music business works. That's funny. That's funny. Well, let me ask you, because I we were saying at the beginning, like that I had you on my, on my, uh, Profitable Musician Summit back in 2019. And we talked about releasing music. And, you know, back then you were kind of talking about like a season of releases. And, and I agree mm -hmm. with this too, like releasing mm -hmm. singles leading up to an EP or an album. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of the way things are working with TikTok and short form video and what we talked about earlier is changing that? Not really, because I think, um, I think uh, the way I sort of think about what's happening on TikTok I, you know, and I, I mentioned already that, you know, that it doesn't start with distribution. D distribution isn't necessarily the starting point. The way I sort of look at it in the greater album and cycle is that those things kind of have taken the place of really what radio used to be. Um, you know, if you think back when radio was the main driving force for music discovery way before streaming services and all that. A single for like an album would be out several months playing on the radio before the album came out. So that's how they would be like setting up anticipation so that on release day, everybody's running to the record store to buy stuff. So I think what we see in social is just a modern version of that, that people are just trying to get people to care and they're not going to, you, you know, you don't care about a song on first listen usually. I mean, some of my favorite artists and favorite songs that I could name the first time I heard it I probably went mm, it's all right you know but then you hear it a few times and you start to understand it and dig into it and it makes sense I think on the TikTok side what is really different is is really the the creation process where artists will write a chorus to a song that doesn't have any verses yet post it on TikTok and sort of use it as uh you know to, as a, to see if people care and mm -hmm. if that song if people like it they'll go write a verse for it and if they continue to like it they'll finish out the song and go record the whole thing and so that i think as far as like once you get to the recording process and releasing i still think that that um releasing a couple singles setting up an album or ep is still uh the most beneficial release pattern that i've seen and then following it up with more material like remixes live versions acoustic versions you know um you know maybe a collaboration with an artist that does a remix or things like that and that way um you have a time period where there's a lot of reasons for people to be pushing the play button you know because that's the other thing is you got to get people actually listening to your music it's not just about making a sale it's about real listeners so that's why i think the whole kind of season of release thing makes sense and having something that has more than one track come out like an album or ep because people can only listen to one song for so long but mm -hmm. um and there's some music that you make that doesn't make sense without the context of a broader album um you know there's some artists that don't make albums anymore but i don't think the album's dead or the the ep is dead i think it's just a matter of you know understanding who your audience is but also understanding uh strategically how people function and you know if you keep dropping a new track every day i'm not going to pay attention after oh, a while no. i just i'm just can't do it 
you know some people are just like well shouldn't i just release all singles like i let's say i've got an album of 10 songs shouldn't i just release them all as singles and then at the end release it as an album and i see where they're coming from because like okay you get a chance to get in front of editorial and you can you know have your promotion cycle for each song but also you know i was talking with my daughter and, and she's like but i you know if i love an artist when they come up with an album I want to have some things I'd never heard to like dig into and get excited yeah. about and really listen to this album. And if I'd already heard them all as singles, it's not going to be interesting to me. Yeah, I that's I agree with that. And also, because I, I get asked that question all the time, like I've got 12, 12 songs and shouldn't I just do one a month and at the end of the year release a whole album? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I won't care by the time that album comes out. Trust me. And I can tell you, I don't think there's ever been an album where all 12 songs could stand as singles on their own. That's and people, right. I know people care. I know we want to think that like every song is, it's so precious, you know, but you got to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, and I think it, it can also, yeah. I, I think when you just start thinking that way, it's like, there are songs that I love, even songs that my band has done that I love and that our fans love, but if they were released individually, they would land in a very weird way um, hmm. just because they don't have the context of the broader creation. So, I mean, I think about a band like Radiohead uh, who has had very different sounds on different albums. And, you know, if you go from Kid A to whatever came next, which was very different, I forget the name of the album. I didn't like it. So, <laughs> but if you just dropped one of those tracks and be like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? I don't even understand what, what, like the last thing I heard was this band with guitar players, bass, drums, and a singer. And this is just some weird ambient thing. I don't understand what you just put out here. But when you put it in a broader context of an album, even though I didn't care for it, it makes more artistic sense. And, you know, I think also for artists that are out touring, having that album gives a whole new chunk of material that fans expect they're going to see in the set and you can make a show around and all that. When you just keep dribbling out songs, there's never really that reset. I think the album is also a great time for the band to upgrade their branding, their image mm -hmm. and all that, where, it, where people expect a new experience from that artist, whether it's the tour, their website, the merch, they, a new album kind of signifies this is a whole new product line. Interesting. That's an interesting idea. And I mean, I think about, you know, Taylor Swift when she came out with her albums during the pandemic. And I was like, wow, these are very different from what she was doing before. And but it, it, it like it really hit with me. I'm like, I really love this. It's so different from her other stuff. Yeah. But I wanted to listen to it as an entire album. Like maybe a few of those were good for singles, but that was just kind of like a whole immersive experience of like, this is who she's pivoting into. Yeah. And I don't think I would have gotten it if I would have just listened to some singles. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Well, I guess I think too about like with TikTok and stuff and like putting your stuff out there, maybe you're putting out a, a chorus and seeing if it'll land. You're also dependent on, well, is TikTok going to show this to the right people? Because what if, yes. you know, you've got this great chorus and then it's like you get 50 views or whatever. It's like, I, I can't get a read on this. Yeah, that that's honestly, I've been I've been making a lot of like informational videos for artists on Instagram reels and TikTok. And it is blowing my mind how different the algorithms work and how different the platforms work. Mm -hmm. I'll have a video perform incredibly well on Instagram and I can't even get TikTok to show it to anybody. That's how it, my even my um my educational videos are like that. One will blow up on Instagram and it's like the numbers on TikTok are terrible and then vice versa. Yeah, exactly. And it 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 the, the frustrating thing with TikTok cuz like I've had an Instagram account for for ages, but I just started using my TikTok one right before Christmas and starting to build a following and and it's all information for artists. You know, I, when I post something, it's like TikTok's main concern isn't showing it to the people that follow you. Cause it's mm -hmm. like, sometimes it's like, it'll go hours without even getting a view. I'm like, I know. I'm like, is, is something broken? I'll be keep yeah, checking exactly. the number. <laughs> exactly. Um, but then, then sometimes randomly 100 people will instantly see. I, it's just weird. Right. I don't, 
I don't get it, but um, that or is I wake up in the morning and I was all these views and I'm like, are all these people that are watching like in across the world? Like why all of a sudden did I get views in the nighttime? Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It's weird. I've been trying to figure it out and I, the, the, it makes no sense. I watch all these videos by social media gurus who like, oh, this is how it works. I'm like, yeah, you say that. I tried that. Mm. And sometimes it does work. Sometimes I think it's just, in, they're all just inconsistent. Um, but, you know, I think for artists uh, on TikTok, I think some, I think what's important and one of the things that I saw with, um, cause I did do some, do some training courses around like uh, building up TikTok plat your you know profile and and following um and they even had a video from tiktok uh i think we're talking about how the platform is evolving very rapidly so things that worked last year on tiktok at this time probably won't work now or won't work as well and are going to be shifting drastically but the one piece of advice they said that was so that i thought was the best that i heard in that whole thing is that they they said we're changing we've been changing the algorithm and what's most important is that the people that follow you follow you because of you not because of a trend and the, and so they said if you want to build an audience around your content then make it about you not about these trends i thought that was fascinating for somebody from tiktok to be saying when these you know obviously the trends have been stuff that that are very sticky you know you, you're some random person that's not trying to build a following and you post the video just you know jumping on a trend and you get you get a hundred thousand views it, it's like oh this is amazing this is so much fun i'm gonna but if you're trying to build an audience and those people follow you they're probably following you because of that trend not because you're a musician or they like what you do uh, an artist i'm working with she just randomly posted a video about pickles got a million views she got a lot of followers she got all these people messaging her about pickles she's not interested in building an account around pickles and so that's what a lot of these trends can do is they can and then ultimately tiktok is confused about who likes your content yeah and so really it's just about being consistent finding the people that that like what you do and honestly i've tried i've actually uh boosted some posts on TikTok. It's really affordable and works pretty well. I, I've almost, it looked like 95% of the follows I got were legit. Mm. <laughs> and it looked like of that, almost all of them were musicians. And that's the art, art the audience I was going after. So, um, and it was very affordable. So it's like, that's something if you're trying to get your account off the ground or you're an artist, that's like, it's, it might be confusing who your audience is. Take a piece of content that's exactly what you want people to know you for. Boost it. TikTok will find the right audience and help you start, you know, um, building that up a bit. And, and I was surprised. I've done that with Instagram recently and TikTok. And for five bucks, you can do some good stuff with it. That's interesting to know. I'll have to try that out. I'm curious, though, you know, they always tell us you want to be authentic on social media, you know, like be who you are and all that stuff, like all parts of you are part of the brand and everything. But then like what you said about pickles or like my friends who, you know, posted something about like, do, you know, doing this cool thing with her hair or yeah. uh, a job interview that she went on or whatever that like had nothing to do with music, but then people started following them for that. And yeah. so I'm wondering like with TikTok, should we just keep things really to the people that we want to follow us, like the subject matter, music and in general, and then maybe like Instagram, maybe even on stories or whatever, or the place to share those kinds of things where it's just basically your followers. Yeah. I mean, on TikTok, especially based on what, you know, I've, the training that I've gone through recently and the people I'm following, it's like, you have to keep it around your content. You can use trends and things, but you need to use them sparingly and also ensure that it's still around the content that you create because yeah, if, if your goal is to build an audience around your music or a subject matter that you're an expert in, then that's why people need to be there. Um, and they really emphasized that. Uh, you know, the one thing to me that that's that TikTok is going through, um, where the other one other major social networks are not, 
is TikTok went from, you know, the user acquisition phase, and now they're moving into the monetization phase. And we've all seen what happens with Facebook hmm. when that happens. Like suddenly you have to pay to reach your fans. No one like Facebook will show your content to about 1% of your followers to see how they react. If they react positively and quickly, they'll open it up a little bit more, but you'll still never reach all your followers by a long shot without paying for it. Instagram has done, you know, they're constantly like, oh, it's stories now. Oh, it's reels. Oh, it's this. And if you're not doing those things, you're, you, no one's seeing your stuff. With TikTok, um, you know, those things are starting to come into play. They're trying to go more mainstream. It's not just about younger audiences who want to get there on their lip sync or um, do these trends. They're trying to be a mainstream social network. And by mainstream, I mean that all generations mm -hmm. use it. And that to me was very apparent. Uh, I don't know if you watch sports, but TikTok was a major sponsor of all the college football bowl games, which uh, I don't think I've ever, ever seen a social network spend that kind of money because that was an uh, insane amount of money to be like the halftime show sponsor of all these games that rank up there in some of the top sporting events as far as tv viewing in the united states and so that's some real cash and that they're not trying to reach teenagers with those no, ads. they're trying they're to trying reach to... our generation with that yes. one yes yeah and that to me signals that there's big changes on the horizon the algorithm the platform how it works because uh people in their 40s are not gonna sit on tiktok by and large the people that they want that aren't already using the platform and do trends and things like that. That's not what most of those folks are going to do. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Well, this has been a super interesting conversation across the board. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about or the related to stuff that we talked about that you think needs to be said while we're here? Obviously we want you guys to go listen to the episode that we were referring to. I'm sure that will be out by the time this comes out on the yes. DIY musician podcast, but anything else you want people to, to know? Um, I just think it's a great time to be re writing, recording and releasing music. Uh, you know, uh, I was telling, you know, one of the artists that I'm managing, I was like, at the end of the day, you just gotta know that r making music is awesome. Writing and recording music is awesome. And the fact that you get to do that is amazing. Most people will never experience that joy in their lifetime of like having a song idea in their head and making it a reality that other people can go and listen to. And to me, that's incredible. Um, and you know, at CD baby, we'd love for you to use us to distribute your music. It's just nine 99 for a release. And that covers everything, all your monetization, all the options that other people nickel and dime you for and no annual fees. And whether it's an album or a single, it's nine 99 and that includes everything barcode and all. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, it, you know, I've, I've uh, been had had been a part of projects that have been selling well and doing incredible. I've been on big tours and I've also been <laughs> on the projects that don't do anything, playing shows that nobody comes to. I've seen it all uh, and I keep making music because it's awesome. And being able to do that is just something that uh, at the end of the day, as an artist and musician, you got to you got to enjoy the process because most people will never get to experience that. I think that's so important because so many times we just, it's so easy to focus on the negative. Oh, I don't have time for social media and I have to do that. And oh, it's so expensive to create an album. And, you know, oh, I have to do marketing and I, you know, still have to work my other two jobs to be able to pay off my last album. You know, like that <laughs> is what we, this is what we hear all the time. And yeah. it's like, let's focus on the fact that like 99% of people cannot do what you just did yeah. making that album. Yeah. And it, I think if artists wired their brain to think more that way, it would actually help their marketing efforts as well, because so many people, so many of their fans are just fascinated by the creation process. To us, it's like, yeah, this is what you do. Just like you go to your job. This is what what we do. And everybody knows. I'm like, no, most people, they don't understand. And it's fascinating and interesting to them. But but yeah, it the fact that being able to do it and you know, because I, I started in a generation where if you weren't selected by a label, you wouldn't get to do it. That's right. And so the fact that anyone can make a record that 
has the passion and abilities uh, is is a great place to be. Yes, absolutely. And I, CD Baby, I always recommend it. You know, people always ask me, there's so many places to distribute. Should I do this? Should I do that? And I'm like, I have always had my stuff at CD Baby because it's just easy. It's a one-stop shop, easy. You know that when you pay, your thing is released. You never have to worry about it disappearing, <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's yeah. that's why I recommend it. And that's why I use it for my own CDs that I've released. So I highly recommend CD Baby to all of you guys if you haven't checked it out. And they have a great conference every year, which I've never made to because you never put it close enough to California, may I mention. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to travel that far. We're we're making an, an announcement next week about what we're doing this year. It won't be in California though. I know. It'll ne- it's always somewhere in the middle. I get why you do it in the middle, but there is a good I, I will say uh there is a good conference that I'm a part of, but it's not my thing. So I'm not at liberty to announce it yet. That is coming to LA. That's going to be good. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yes. I'll have to so look in out June in LA. Yeah. See, I always do the taxi conference because it's always in LA and it's yeah. very, very easy for me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, be, be on the lookout for something in late June in Ooh. LA. Okay, I will. Thank you for that tip. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. This has been really great. I encourage you all to check out their podcast. It's always very entertaining um, and informative. And of course, check out CD Baby to release your music. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.